everybody welcome to general hospital mv my gh after show let's get into it it has been one hell of a week for sunny and carly i mean aside from the nina drama laura paid sunny a visit to tell him that luke died and sunny's reaction was honestly perfect i mean first jason then liam now luke i mean i would slam down on a table and throw my hands up too like three deaths in two months are you joking sunny and laura also talked about the nina situation and i like that laura just kept on asking again and again like why are you protecting nina though it's clear that she knows that he has feelings for her so I appreciate that she just kept on asking and also she brings up the fact that he needs to start seeing things from Carly's perspective and I agree with Laura but on the flip side I also think that that uh, Carly and Michael need to see things from Sunny's side as well because those two are frankly getting on my nerves more than Sunny one thing to note after Laura left Sunny's house is that Sunny gets a text message from his pharmacy saying that his meds that he takes for his bipolar disorder has expired and he needs to get a refill and Sunny dead ass ignores the message. I'm like, oh no, here we go again. Meanwhile, Carly paid a visit to Nina and it went horribly. Carly, as you know, is a glutton for punishment, so she was asking Nina for details on their relationship in Nixon Falls, and she just kept on hounding and hounding and hounding Nina until Nina finally gave her those details. Nina told Carly that Sunny wanted to have sex with her and that she turned her down, and if she didn't, they would have slept together. And that hurt Carly so much so that she slapped Nina. It was kind of a mediocre slap, and Frank Valentini went onto his Twitter and made it seem like it was like the slap of the century, but it was so like, it was so little, but evidently it hurt enough that Nina had to put ice on it later. Also, Nina brought up that she and Sunny had a run-in on New Year's Eve, which of course Sunny didn't tell Carly about, so that made her even more mad. Once Carly left, Willow paid her a visit with a proposition. Give up your rights to Wiley as his grandmother, and I will get Michael to give you visitation whenever you want. And while I think Willow was coming from a decent place, she is fooling herself. I mean, if y'all have watched General Hospital as long as I have, you know damn well that Michael used to lock Sonny and Carly in a basement when they were having relationship problems. There is no way in hell he's gonna cool off with the woman that blew up Sonny and Carly's marriage currently. Michael Carinthos is literally a man-child. He ain't gonna let Nina get away with this. Nina knows it too. In fact, she hires Martin as her new lawyer to go over some options with him. But if you ask her bestie, Ava, she thinks it's a bad idea to go after Michael because she thinks that if she she does, she will lose Sunny forever. And she's probably not wrong. And even Valentine thinks it's a bad idea to go after Michael. Clearly, Phyllis's wise words last week are falling on deaf ears because she really wants to be with Sunny and thinks that she has a chance. And honestly, if Sunny's off his meds, she might. Sunny and Carly spent the rest of the week arguing and getting absolutely nowhere, to no one's surprise, and it resulted in Carly moving into the Metro Court and Michael arguing with Sunny. Because he doesn't want to see his mom hurt, rightfully so, it makes sense, but Sunny thinks that they can't work out their marital problems unless they're under the same roof, and Michael thinks it's better to give Carly some space. Dante actually steps into Michael and Sonny's argument and breaks it up a little bit, but it's clear that Sonny is getting more and more unhinged. I really gotta give Maurice props because if we didn't know as an audience that his meds had run out, he is playing it so subtly well that you can tell that Sonny is slowly descending and that there's something off about him. Props to Maurice for that. And it's also obvious that we haven't even hit the tip of the iceberg for his madness. It's like a slow burn, I appreciate that. Side note, in the midst of all that chaos, Sunny did mention to Carly that Luke died, and of course she was worried about Bobby, but Sunny mentions that Bobby was given a sedative by Lucas to help her sleep. So it's good to know that Lucas is actually still in town since we never see him. At the end of the week, Carly ran into Drew at the Metro Court and they had a really nice conversation where Carly actually apologized for being a bad friend back when he found out that he wasn't Jason. And I'm glad that they're having this conversation because Carly and Sunny were like Drew who when the real Jason came back. So it's nice that she did apologize. Drew did say that he was long since over it, but I would be kind of bitter, but he did say that he also 
pushed Sonny and Carly away at the time, but can you blame him? They dumped him like yesterday's news. Carly also realized that she doesn't know the real Drew at all and is excited to actually get to know him this time around. Y'all sensing what I'm sensing? Oh no. <laughs> oh god. Drew and Carly, here we go. Alright, since we talked about Luke, let's touch base on his widow, Tracy. She is in the slammer and Ned hires Martin to try to get him to cut a deal for her and she refuses to take it because she needs to be home now, not cut a plea deal. She wants to get Luke's affairs in order and she wants to confront Brooklyn about Bailey, of course. Now luckily for Tracy, Alexis started having second thoughts on kicking Tracy while she was down and for Luke's sake she refused to cooperate with the PCPD, therefore they let Tracy out of jail because there was no case without Alexis's cooperation. And Alexis of course didn't even get so much of a thank you. Mostly because Tracy was probably on a mission to find Brooklyn and track her down and confront her about Bailey, which she did. Tracy thinks it's best that she takes Bailey slash Louise back to Amsterdam with her so that she can hide her out better from Peter August. But even Brooklyn knows that Peter has long hands and they can reach all the way to Amsterdam even if he is in prison. Chase comes up with a plan B to have them move in together and live in a new house so that he can be there to protect Bailey 24-7. I don't see how that's a better plan than Chase moving in or Brooklyn moving into Chase's place. They're gonna rent a new place. Like, it doesn't make sense to me, but... It is what it is. I think at this point, no matter where they put Bailey, Peter is going to find out that that baby is his. Unfortunately for Brooklyn, she's gotta watch her back in more ways than one because Valentine and Austin want revenge on Brooklyn as well. More on that a little bit later, but for now, let's talk about Alexis because before she had agreed to not cooperate with the PCBD so that Tracy could get out of jail, she was having lunch with Sam at Charlie's and Harmony walks in and Sam puts Harmony on notice. Sam doesn't trust Harmony as far as she can throw her and I honestly don't blame her for that. I do think that Harmony is sincere in regretting what she had done with Shiloh and obviously for Sam it's hard for her to forgive her for what she did to Christina and all those other girls as well. Harmony simply asks that Sam gives her a chance to prove herself and Sam says, yeah, fine, but I'm watching you. I really am rooting for Harmony in this situation. Like, yeah, she clearly does regret what she did and she was just manipulated by Shiloh just like the rest of the girls. So she's just trying to move on with her life and pick up the pieces, get some new friends, make it up to her daughter, etc. I don't expect Sam to forgive her and neither does Harmony, so you know, just accept that Harmony is no longer the person that she was under Shiloh, just like Christina isn't. Alright, let's talk about Spencer. Now as his ever so dramatic 30 day stint in jail gets closer, everyone in Spencer's life is trying to get Spencer's ducks in a row for him. As Spencer and Esme were about to boink on his grandmother's couch, which, ew. Thank God Victor showed up to give Spencer a stern talking to about the importance of family togetherness and loyalty. Laura comes home and is very shocked to see Victor in her house and the two of them get into a heated argument that Spencer and Esme were very amused watching. Later in the week, Laura calls Nicholas over to have him and Spencer hash out their problems and initially it was going well until Esme showed up and stood in front of the family and said that she wouldn't let them bully him. Kevin couldn't get Esme out of the house fast enough, but it didn't matter because after that, Spencer was saying that Esme is the only one looking out for Spencer at this point. Kevin takes Esme out for coffee and starts asking her about her family life and Esme's like, don't shrink me, I know a thing or two about psychology. Esme thinks it's pretty laughable for Kevin to say that family is generally a safe space to be at when his own brother is Ryan Chamberlain and she does have a point a little bit but she can't compare Laura and Nicholas to Ryan Chamberlain and he points that out to her. Kevin does actually raise the question to Esme on how often she sees Ryan Chamberlain while on her internship at Spring Ridge and while she says barely any, he clearly doesn't believe her because the second she walks out, he is calling Spring Ridge and saying to restrict access for Ryan Chamberlain. That guy knows a psychopath when he sees one. I mean, when you really think about it though, every single person that has interacted with Esme seems unsettled, right? Even Ryan Chamberlain himself. Esme's personality is so inconsistent that every single person is picking up on it. They know when she's putting on an act. And yet no one is warning Spencer away from her yet. Like every single one of you have been around psychopaths long enough to know that they need to cut this off at the knees before things escalate and things are definitely going to escalate with Esme. One thing that I forgot to mention last week is that Esme went to GH to pick up some kind of prescription. The nurse warned her that it's powerful stuff and she was like, don't worry, I know how to use it. So clearly she's planning on drugging somebody. 
I'm guessing at the cabin when all the all the teenagers go. Again, Trina, you and Danger Girl, be careful. Anyway, back to Laura for a second. While she is still trying to get Nicholas and Spencer to settle their differences, Spencer giggles and says that she is more like Victor than she thinks, and Laura basically says to bite your tongue and to watch your back because he is not someone to take at face value, which we know this because the writing that is so messy for Victor says so. Now with that in mind, let's talk about Peter August. Felicia finally had some one-on-one -on -one time with Peter August, and while she got to get a couple of digs in about how he didn't have a soul, Peter absolutely crushed her with throwing her history in her face, essentially. He brought up the fact that Felicia dumped her girls on Mac to go on an adventure and be with Frisco, and that she wasn't even in town when Georgie got murdered. He was just trying to poke holes at her weaknesses in an attempt to get her to believe that he knows where Louise is. And see, this is the problem with this storyline, is that no one involved is communicating with each other, because if they were, then someone could tell Tell Felicia that it is clear that Peter has no idea where Louise is. I mean, there are multiple characters in this story that have brought up to Peter that Louise is out there and could be dead because of him, and he flips out every single time and if anyone could bring that up to Felicia then she wouldn't have felt as vulnerable. But the fact that no one is really communicating in the story is probably what's gonna lead the bad guys straight to Louise. For instance, Victor had a conversation with Austin this week and he knows that Austin is the one that helped Valentine find out that Brooklyn's baby wasn't his. Austin unfortunately also mentioned to Victor that Maxie and Brooklyn's friendship is pretty new because ever since Louise went missing, Brooklyn's been nice to have her spend time with Bailey. Victor also ran into Maxie and Anna at the Metro Court and of course things got a little hostile and Maxie stood up to him and said, you need to let Peter know that I will not allow him to find my baby. Victor is gonna put two and two together and then he's gonna go straight to Peter because Peter has something that he wants and I'm guessing it's control of Drew Kane. He would gladly throw Maxie and her baby under the bus for the information that he needs. And to top all that off, we were made aware this week that Peter is well enough to be transferred to Pentonville and y'all know that any of these transfer vans never get to their destination. Peter is clearly going to escape. That is why this story is so incredibly frustrating because we know that it's going to go in favor of Peter August again for for the billionth time. At what point will the show actually give the audience what it wants? Because this is insane. We have waited long enough for this mofo to die. Make it happen. We're done. We're over it. It's 2022. Wrap it up. If only Selena Wu got the dosage right on the poison, then we wouldn't be in this predicament right now. And speaking of that, we learned this week that Brad is aware that he poisoned Peter August and he's scared. Now at the time, he didn't know that he was poisoning Peter August. He knew that he was delivering a food tray to an inmate, he didn't know why. But then, of course, he found out later what happened. Selene has got Brad's life in his hands and he doesn't know what to do about it. He actually confides to Brit about this and of course she is scared for her friend and is determined to get him away from his auntie, but she knows someone that could help him out. Any guesses as to who it is? Because I don't know. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Speaking of Brit, she and Austin had some hilarious scenes earlier in the week where they were trying to be each other's wingman and they were absolutely failing at it. It was funny, but of course it was really just scenes so that Austin could admit that he has feelings for Maxie. And let's face it, the only good wingman for Brit is Brad. Love their friendship. All right, let's switch things up and talk about Marshall and Curtis for a bit. Marshall finally started to open up a little bit as to what happened in the past. To summarize, he got involved with some really bad people and he ended up in danger and it almost ended up on his family's doorstep. So he decided to fake his death and run away so that his family could be protected. We don't know who it is yet, but it appears to be a mobster and Curtis wants to know who it is so that he can go into protective mode, not only for his own family, but for his father as well. And of course, Marshall refuses and the relationship just gets, you know, more and more complicated. Honestly, Curtis and Marshall should just take some notes from Trina and Portia because they're doing fine. Despite having a bit of a bumpy road for a while, Trina is opening up to her mother about her personal life, which is quite nice to see. She is clearly uncomfortable with Curtis and Portia, but she does have a stance of, you know, as long as they're happy, then I'm happy for you. Really, Spencer should be taking some notes too, but Trina opens up to Portia about how she didn't appreciate 
that Ava used her to punish Spencer a little bit. And then she brings up the fact that she does not want to go to the cabin with Cameron and, and Jocelyn and Spencer and Esme. But she also wants to be there because she does want to give Spencer a good send off before his 30 day stunt in prison. And she's honest about how she feels bad for him. She's like, yeah, I know he's privileged and that 30 days isn't a lot, but for Spencer it is because he grew up as privileged as he was. So this is very hard for Spencer. Lastly, let's talk about Finn and Elizabeth. Now, if you guys are watching this show last week, you guys know that I was a little bit confused on the scene where Elizabeth finds Franco's wedding ring in her locker. She seemed scared, but I wasn't sure on whether to read it as Elizabeth not really being sure she wants to move on from Franco yet, or if someone put it in there. This week we got confirmation that someone did in fact put it in there. Elizabeth is terrified, but of course she's trying to be rational about it. She does think that it's one of her kids that put it in there, but I, and like, I, I think I said last week too that I think that that might be the case, that maybe it's Jake that's doing it since we haven't seen him for a while. But honestly, I'm kind of hoping that I'm wrong. I'd rather them go a surprising route and maybe make it Hayden or Jeff since we want to see them again. And it would be a little less boring too. Who do you guys think put that ring in Elizabeth's locker? Let me know in the comments below. Anyway, that wraps things up here. There was a lot to talk about, but I feel like also it wasn't really that exciting of a week. At least some of the stories moved a little bit, like in terms of Marshall and Curtis, but not really that much. We did get a few funny little moments though. For instance, I like that Tracy called Martin Kentucky Fried Lawyer. I like that Felicia and Maxie took a shot of whiskey in Luke's honor. Oh, I actually forgot one more thing. So this week, Drew was informed by Sam as to how Valentine got his shares for ELQ. She told him the whole assorted story about how she went to jail for killing Shiloh and how when she got out she had a bad parole officer that wasn't letting her be with Jason and that Valentine offered to get her a better parole officer in exchange for control of uh, his shares for ELQ because they were going to Danny and Scout but they made an agreement that they would get the shares back when they turned 21. Naturally the elephant in the room is that clearly Jason and Sam didn't last because she was in a relationship with Dante before Jason died and and when Drew asks why, she's like, well, she wanted Jason to give up his lifestyle so that the kids would no longer be in danger and that's something that Jason couldn't give. And I like that Drew pointed out the irony that when he was Jason, he did exactly that. He didn't say it in a shady way, but he's like, that's kind of funny. And that's kind of what you have with Dante now, that's great. In all honesty, when I look back at Steve Burton's return as Jason, however many years ago that was now, they really shit the bed with his return because realistically, the story that Drew's Jason got is what Steve Burton's Jason probably should have had when he returned. Because being held captive for five years, you think that he would realize, hey, the danger that I put myself through kept me away from my family, my wife, and my kid. Maybe I should move on from that. And he didn't. He ended up just being the same old Jason. And what happened at the end? He no longer had a wife. He was a distant father to his kids, and he was always Sonny and Carly's lapdog. And then you know what happened? He got killed, or at least recaptured by the same damn guy that held him captive the last time. Ain't that some shit? What an unfortunate end for the character. Anyway, I'm gonna end this video here. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Stay tuned this Wednesday for another live stream where we're gonna look at some classic scenes from GH and just chit chat about GH as well but if you liked this video here give it a big old thumbs up subscribe if you want to hit the notification bell if you want to see my videos right when they come out and I will catch you guys next time peace out